In 1945, with a flash of light, the world entered the nuclear age. For better or worse, humanity has managed to harness the boundless potential of nuclear power. During the opening of the Cold War, it was believed that the splitting of the atom would be the solution to even the most mundane problems. With the power of science and more than a little bit of creativity, American engineers applied nuclear power to a tank design. Or at least they tried to. Development After the Second World War, the United States was in need of updated tanks should the Cold War turn hot. At a defense conference, Operation Question Mark was proposed, a project designed to create the next generation of tanks. The only restriction on the project was that the tank had to be ready for production by 1961, the hope being to create something so out of the box that the Soviets would have no countermeasure for it. Several experimental tanks were proposed as a result of this project, including the Sleek Rex and the Lightweight Wasp, and the one-man tank and helicopter hybrid, the Falcon. Stepping up to the challenge, automobile manufacturer Chrysler began the development of their own tank dubbed the TV-8. The concept was for an all-purpose design that could handle multiple roles, amphibious to cross waterways without the need for bridges, an extensive range that mitigated the need for constant refueling, and was resistant to the conditions of a nuclear blasted landscape that it may have operated under. A single prototype of this revolutionary design was made before the project was shelved. Propulsion the only prototype of the TV-8 was fitted with a Chrysler 8-cylinder 300-horsepower engine, which powered a pair of electric motors, which in turn drove the road wheels. This was only used as a temporary measure to demonstrate proof of concept. The real power plant would come later. There were several options considered, including a gas turbine electric drive, a hydrocarbon-powered vapor cycle engine, and something much more radical. The final version of the TV-8 would be propelled by an internal nuclear fission engine. The exact makeup of this engine is unknown, as it was never fully developed before the project was halted. However, it can be assumed that it would utilize fission, or the splitting of uranium atoms, which would generate heat, causing water to be converted into steam, which would turn a turbine powering the motors. The concept of a nuclear energy power source has been successfully used on ships and submarines, but has never been implemented on land vehicles. The reason for this was a matter of efficiency. Uranium is energy dense, with a pound of the element providing 108,000 times the amount of power as the same weight of diesel fuel, giving the vehicle a theoretically indefinite fuel range. This would free up logistics systems, which would be at risk in the event of open warfare between the nuclear-armed superpowers. Design the TV-8 was designed with two halves. The lower portion were the tracks, which propelled the vehicle. Above that was the large and unwieldy-looking turret, which housed everything else. The weapons, ammunition, crew, nuclear reactor, transmission, and all other components. These two halves can be detached and transported separately, making hauling the tank long distances much easier. The turret itself was made of two parts. An outer layer, which was smooth, the only exception being the roof, which had a hatch for crew access while the inner layer was armored, protecting the crew and internal workings. Between the layers was nothing but air, which gave the TV-8 positive buoyancy. Being able to float on the back of the turret was a water jet pump, which could propel it across water. Dimensions the TV-8 was only made as a prototype, and this was more of a proof of concept than a practical fighting platform. With this in mind, it still was a lightweight tank, weighing in at 25 tons. It was also 29 feet or 8.8 .8 meters long, including the main gun, 11 feet or 3.4 meters wide, and 9.5 feet or 2.9 meters high. Hey champion, listen up. The battlefield awaits, and Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus is your mission briefing. This is tactical warfare at its finest, right in the palm of your hand. Do you think this is just a game? No, sir. This is a way of life. Your orders? Deploy an elite strike force, over 80 legendary champions across 18 factions. Whether you roll with the relentless Necrons or the war-hungry orcs, the battle is yours to command. You'll engage in high-stake battles, take on PvP skirmishes against rival champions, or team up in co-op missions where you know someone's got your back. Adapt, strategize, and crush the enemy, because in the grim darkness of the far future, failure is not an option. 
The developers are constantly reinforcing the game with new content, modes, and events, so the fight never gets stale. The game has a 4.5 star rating, and with Games Workshop's official seal of approval, this is the ultimate tactical Warhammer experience. Download now. The Emperor demands victory. Armament the TV-8 was designed with the intention of facing down Soviet tanks on the open battlefields of Europe. It was heavily armed with a 90mm T-208 main cannon, which would be powerful enough to destroy enemy armor. The gun would be fixed in place, unable to elevate or depress on its own. A pair of hydraulic cylinders would raise or lower the turret as needed, though. Unfortunately, the exact configuration of this system has been lost to history. A hydraulic loading arm would also assist in loading the cannon. There was also a proposal for the main main gun to use a liquid propellant rather than the conventional solid gunpowder. The propellant would be injected into the firing chamber behind the projectile and ignited, eliminating the need for shell casings. Furthermore, the liquid propellant could be held in tanks of any shape or size, making storage much easier than conventional shells. Due to technological limitations, this idea was abandoned. For protection against infantry, it had a pair of 30 caliber machine guns mounted coaxially in the turret. There were also plans for a 50 caliber machine gun to be mounted on top of the turret. This would be operated remotely by a crew member inside. Armor the exact armor protection of the TV-8 is difficult to determine, since the only prototype was a wooden mock-up, though some information can be gleaned from the surviving blueprints. Plans indicate that the sides of the turret would be about 3 inches or 80 millimeters thick. The front of the turret was around 2 and 3 quarter inches or 70 millimeters thick. Like many tanks, this was improved with the use of sloped armor, a concept taken to its extreme. The front of the turret conical in shape with a 68 degree bend, and the sides 45 degrees, much steeper angles than on more conventional tanks, and gave the TV-8 its distinctive eggshell silhouette. Crew the TV-8 was designed to accommodate a crew of four, all of whom would be situated within the turret. The driver was located on the front left, next to the main gun, while the gunner would be situated on the right-hand side. The loader would be located behind the gunner, while the commander would sit behind the driver. It's presumed that the driver would see the outside of the tank with a series of telescopes, though this cannot be confirmed due to the lack of any specific information. What is known is that the commander would be able to view the outside world through a series of closed circuit television screens. In addition to giving him a view of the outside world, this also meant that there were fewer openings, which would prevent the crew from being blinded in the event of a nuclear blast. Flaws the TV-8 was experimental, a radically new concept in tank design that was the product of Cold War designers' imagination being given a free reign. While innovative in concept, it was far from a practical design, though. Foremost was the power plant. In theory, this would streamline logistics, enabling it to have an extended range on a minimal amount of fuel. In practice, this would be a dangerous setup. Any nuclear reactor, no matter how well insulated, would constantly bathe the crew with radiation and would permeate into the vehicle itself. On some nuclear-powered ships, for instance, there can be up to a hundred tons of lead shielding to protect the crew. A reactor on a tank would not be that extensive, but any amount of lead sufficient enough to block out the radiation would also add so much weight as to render the tank too heavy to operate effectively. As a result, crews would continuously have to rotate out of service in order to avoid the health issues of radiation exposure. Repair crews would likewise be exposed to high amounts of radiation and would require specialized equipment and protective gear for even the most routine maintenance. Should the tank be hit on the battlefield or even simply crash into an object, there's no risk of a nuclear explosion, but the leaking of radioactive material is inevitable. Should this happen, the tank as well as the surrounding area will become irradiated, affecting the surviving crew members and the environment as well. Virtually everyone on the battlefield would be exposed to lethal doses of radiation from the destruction or even from a damaged single tank. Recovery operations would be hazardous, if not outright impossible, as each wreck would be a miniature Chernobyl, having a lasting impact potentially decades into the future. As well as the nuclear fuel source, the design of the tank had other flaws, namely the turret. Its large size made it top-heavy and difficult to maneuver, and it would be an easy target for the enemy to shoot at, all the while not giving any advantages over more conventional configurations. 
There's also a risk of nuclear proliferation. Nuclear material is difficult to acquire and is carefully guarded by national governments. Something like a tank's power plant, however, could be easily stolen, and terrorist groups could use the radioactive core as part of a dirty bomb or other nefarious purpose. In all, the TV-8 was a flawed concept, which, while creative, its disadvantages outweigh any potential benefits. It remains one of the greatest what-ifs of military history. History. More at home in works of science fiction than on the battlefield. Once again, a huge thanks to our sponsor, Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus. Command legendary champions, dominate PvP battles, and fight for the Emperor in the ultimate tactical Warhammer experience. Download now, because only in death does duty end. The fight never stops.